You guys ready to look at the Word of God? Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Galatians. We're going to pick this up in, in chapter 4. How many of you enjoyed uh, Levi, Pastor Levi Stewart's message last week on Galatians? And then the week before that, Eric Gilmore um, picked up the slack, although I heard in the second service when Eric preached, he didn't get much preaching. And so, aren't you glad you're in a place that when, when God begins to move, we let him move? He is, he is the ultimate agenda, that's why we're here. But I'll tell you what, God speaks to us through his word. Amen? And we, we love his word, and we value it, and we treasure it. So as you're opening there, I'm going to pick up at verse 12. But let me just begin with a word of prayer. Can we do that? Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for your presence. Holy Spirit, I ask this morning that you would speak to each individual person. Lord, that you would translate the words that I say to the needs and the heart and the context of every individual hearer. Lord, we thank you for it and we trust you to do it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Galatians chapter four, beginning in verse 12, the apostle Paul says, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things. For I have become like you Gentiles, free from those laws. You did not mistreat me when I first preached to you. Now let me just pause for a moment and make sure that we're all together in this because this is a series. We've been going through the book of Galatians verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And of course, that means when we jump into the middle of something, if you weren't there for the first part of the journey, you might be a little bit lost. And without taking the time to go back and rehash every detail, you need to understand that what's happening here in a broad sense is that Paul is writing to a group of people that were very near and dear to his heart because they were his spiritual children. These people in Galatia were either directly or indirectly converts of the Apostle Paul. He had started the churches there in Galatia. And so there was a emotional attachment to the spiritual journey that these people had been on. And Paul's gospel to them had been a very simple gospel. He went to Gentiles as a Jew. And he basically told them, all you need to do is put your trust in Jesus Christ. Turn to Jesus. Put your faith in him and you will be saved. And these people had done that. They had believed in Christ, they had been filled with the Spirit, they had been set free from all kinds of perversion and bondage, and they were living productive, fruitful lives in the Spirit. And then, a snake came along. Isn't it interesting how every garden has a snake? The devil will always find his way. It doesn't, you can have the most perfect church, you can have the most perfect family, I promise you the devil's gonna come knocking. And this happened even with Paul's churches there. There were these teachers from Jerusalem. These were Jews. They were traditional uh, Jews who obeyed and observed the law of Moses. And they arrived in, in Galatia. And they began to go around to these churches that Paul had established and teach them. It's great that you guys believe in Jesus. However, if you really want to be children of God, there's one thing you still need to do. You need to be circumcised and you need to follow the law of Moses. And they had made a very persuasive case for this. And so what was happening was that a lot of people were starting to change their persuasion. Yes, they believed in Jesus, they believed that he was the Messiah, but they were also beginning to follow the rules and the regulations and the traditions. And Paul had come along and he had put up a big stink about this because Paul's argument is that if you add anything to the gospel, you void it out. The cross plus anything cannot save you. It is Christ and Christ alone. And so he's preaching this pure gospel. And at this point, he has now made an argument on the basis of logic and reason. He's made a theological argument. He's appealed to common sense. And now you see that he's actually pleading with them on the basis of their friendship and of their relationship. And this is very valid. Look at what he's saying. He said, brothers and sisters, I plead with you People that I love, my, my spiritual children, I plead with you, 
to live in freedom as I do. For I became like you Gentiles, meaning I became free from those laws and I did it for your sake. And if you remember that whole showdown that we talked about a few weeks back where Paul stood up in the face of Peter, remember this? Peter was the one, he was the apostle that had had the original revelation that the gospel was intended not just for the Jews but for the Gentiles. Paul, Peter was that one. And he was the one that announced that Gentiles don't need to follow the law of Moses to be saved. They just need to put their faith in Christ. But then there had come this episode where Peter was eating with some of these Gentile believers and everything was fine until a group of fancy Jewish influential people arrived from Jerusalem and they went to a different table. This was a high table. This was a kosher table. And they were too good to eat with those Gentiles. And when Peter saw this, he suddenly became pressured and he felt intimidated. So he left the table of the Gentiles and he went over to the table of the Jews and separated himself from them as though he were better than them. And Paul stands up in the middle of the cafeteria. Remember my illustration about the schoolgirls, the you know, volleyball players or whatever. Paul stands up in the middle of the cafeteria and calls Peter out and says, you hypocrite. And there's this big showdown. Paul had stood up for the Gentiles. He stuck his neck out for the Gentiles. He had become like a Gentile for their sake. But then here's what happened. So that over time, these very Gentiles who he had been fighting for slowly began to leave his side and go to the other side of the cafeteria to the point that Paul is standing there by himself, going, guys, I did this for your sake. I I'm eating this you know, non-kosher food for you, not for me. I grew up eating kosher. That's what I'm comfortable with. That's normal to me. I'm eating your food for your sake, not for my sake. I'm dressing like this for you. I'm sitting at this table for you. And now you guys went to the other side of the cafeteria. You know, a, a few um, weeks ago, I had a, a party, or I was at a party for, for someone, I won't say too many details so the person doesn't feel embarrassed, but it was a party that was organized at a restaurant in one of their back little rooms, and there was two big tables in this kind of private dining area, and so I wasn't su super happy with that because that meant that now the guests of this party were, were gonna have to be split into two groups. And so we realized, you know, there's almost enough kids to fill up a whole table. So we decided we're going to put the adults at one table and the kids at the other. How many agree that's a great way to do dinner? And so, but, but the problem is some of the kids that were going to have to go to the kids' table were a little bit older. And, and I didn't want them to feel like they were being left out. So I thought, I'm going to be the hero. I'm going to go sit at the kids' table with the kids so that they don't feel left out. And then the adults can have peace and quiet and everybody's going to be happy. And so th this was going really well at first. It was all the adults at one table and then me with a bunch of kids. Until slowly, some of the older kids started getting up and going over to the adult table and pulling up chairs and kind of sitting around them. And then all the little kids got up and decided to go play on the floor. So a few minutes in, I'm sitting there at this whole table by myself. And I'm thinking to myself, guys, I did this for you and now you all walked away from me. This must be something like what Paul was, ex was experiencing. He was saying, come back to my table. I'm here because I want to relate to you. I became like you so that you could have the example of freedom. Now don't leave and go into bondage again. And he reminds them, you did not mistreat me when I first preached to you. Verse 13, surely you remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news. But even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn me away. No, you took me in and cared for me as though I were an angel from God or even Christ Jesus himself. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit that you felt then? I'm sure you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if it had been possible. A deep emotional sentiment being expressed by Paul here. Now, Paul makes some allusion to a sickness that he had. And Bible commentators have debated about what the sickness might have been for a long time. Was it something hereditary? Is it something that happened to him during one of his persecutions? I mean, you, when you read the epistles, 
Paul tells you these stories of being shipwrecked and being beaten and being led, left for dead on the side of the road and then sometimes going right back into a city where he had been beaten. And I'll tell you what, if you get kicked in the head too many times, you're gonna show the wear and tear of that kind of abuse. And so for whatever reason, Paul had some sort of an ailment or an infirmity or a handicap that was apparently visible. People could see it about him. And one of the context clues is that there might have been something that was actually wrong with Paul's eyes. Why do we say that? Well, number one, you see that he tells them here, you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if that were possible. So you see there's an allusion to his eyes there. But also, in Galatians 6.11, Paul writes, see what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. So what, what is that all about? Well, Paul did not write his epistles himself. He, he dictated them through a scribe. And so when it got to the end of the book that he was dictating, he said, here, let me have that scroll. I'm gonna sign it in my own hand. But whenever Paul wrote his name and wrote his farewell, it was apparently so large and so clumsy that it was totally different from all the rest of the writing that had been put there by the professional scribe. That might be another clue that Paul had some problems with his eyesight. But here's the most interesting one. Remember how we, we talked a few weeks ago when I preached on chapter three, the way that chapter three starts is like this. Paul says, remember, O oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Remember that? And remember how I told you that that word bewitched in the Greek is actually the word for the evil eye. We talked about what the evil eye was. The evil eye was a superstition that existed in the ancient world. Actually, it still exists today in many cultures around the world. You might have seen some of these pendants that have like an eyeball, like a blue eyeball in the middle that people use to ward off this superstitious idea of the curse brought on by the evil eye. Well, this was very prominent in Paul's day. And one of the interesting things about the evil eye is that if someone had a problem with their eye, like let's say they had an infection, and their eye was oozing. And I know that's gross, but this was actually something that was going on in that part of the world a lot during this time. If you saw somebody who had something wrong with their eyes, people would naturally make the connection that they are under the influence of the evil eye. And not only that, but they might put the curse of the evil eye on you. And so in order to protect themselves, do you know what people would do? They would spit on the ground. That was the way that they would ward off the evil eye. Now, I know that sounds silly, but that is the way that it worked. Interestingly, interestingly, when Paul writes to the Galatians here, listen to what he says. He says, even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn me away. That word reject there is the Greek word for spit. It's the exact word that was used for people warding off the evil eye. He said, when you saw me, even though you were tempted to spit because of the way I looked, you did not reject me. You treated me like a brother. You took me in. You took care of me as though I were not some horrible, hideous monster, but as though I were one of the angels of God. No, even better, you took care of me as though I were Jesus Christ himself. And then he makes this appeal. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit that you felt then? You can imagine that these Judaizers who had come along and they were attacking Paul's gospel and they were attacking Paul's character and they were maligning him and they were trying to get the, the, the Galatians to cut Paul off. Can you imagine some of the things they were probably saying about him? They probably made it very personal. They were saying, that Paul guy, he's a creep. Look at his eyes. He's under the curse of the evil eye and you guys are listening to him. He even looks weird. You guys need to reject him. No wonder that Paul was saying things like, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Say, I'm under the evil eye. No, you're under the influence of the evil eye. Or, or what about when he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. You're talking about all these curses. Let me tell you something. The only place of curse is outside of the covering of the cross. Or, or what about when he says those who depend upon the law to make them right with God are under the curse? What's he saying? No, those Judaizers are saying I'm the one under the curse. They're the ones that are under the curse because the law itself requires it. And so until recently, 
The Galatians had been faithful to Paul. They had been loyal. They had stood with him, and he had stood with them. They were his spiritual children. But now these Judaizers Judaizers had come between them and had caused a schism. In verse 16 he says, have I now become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? I don't know if you've ever felt that before. But you know, I I mentioned in in the first service, I I grew up in the old fashioned Pentecostal church, five generations. And back then we didn't have nice like sleek uh, podiums like this. We had these. We had these th- things. They were like the Ark of the Covenant. They, they were so big. They required like five people to carry them, and uh, they always had something engraved on the front. I wish I could get one of those big pulpits and engrave on the front of it what Paul says here. Have I now become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? You know, we're living in a culture where, where Christians, where people in general, but Christians in particular, have very little tolerance for truth. Especially if it's truth that hits close to home. Very little tolerance for being told something that we don't like to hear. We are a people of itching years. We've grown up in a trophy culture where we're used to being congratulated and rewarded and affirmed even when we didn't do anything. How many of you just came from a whole bunch of graduations? Even the kindergartners graduate now. <laughs> graduation, uh, you do not graduate kindergarten. You just go to first grade, right? But that's not the culture we live in. Everything, you have to be patted on the back and affirmed and coddled. And if you tell people the truth, they get offended. Can I tell you something? The Bible says better are the wounds of a friend than the kisses of an enemy. If someone really loves you, one of the ways that they show you that they love you is by telling you what you need to hear even when you don't want to hear it. Because look, if I love me more than you, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you whatever it takes to keep you being nice to me. But if I love you, I'm going to risk my own comfort to make sure that you're on the straight and narrow. And this is what Paul was doing here. He was correcting them and he was saying, am I your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor but their intentions are not good. They're trying to shut you off from me so that you'll only pay attention to them. I I can't read this without seeing in my mind like some very relatable scenes. Imagine like a, a teenage daughter. How many of you are fathers here with teenage girls? Okay, you see these hands? We need to intercede for these men. Imagine you have some girl and she's, she's being pursued by a guy and, and you as the father, you look and you know that guy doesn't have good intentions, but he's cute and he speaks the same lingo and they're hanging out together and it's slowly but surely you see how this guy is turning your own daughter against you. Can you imagine there's this part of you that wants to say, I'm the one that held you in my arms when you were a baby. I love you. This person is just trying to get something from you. You're just a product to them. That's what Paul is saying here is, don't be deceived by these guys. They're out for their own selfish gain. Someone's eager to do good things for you, that's all right. But let them do it anytime, not just when I'm with you. Verse 19, oh my dear children, you hear that? It's the heart of a father. I feel like I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully formed in you. I wish I were there with you right now so I could change my tone. But at this distance, I don't know how else to help you. And I tell you something, this, what Paul was facing there in Galatia, what I just described to you that happens sometimes between parents and children, happens between husbands and wives. This is part of the most predictable strategy that the enemy has ever devised. The very first thing that Satan did in the garden, remember? He comes into this perfect paradise, he approaches Eve, and what does he say? The very first words out of his mouth are these. He says, did God really say you can't eat from the fruit of this tree. He says, you, you won't surely die. He's just trying to keep all of this good knowledge from you. See, what he's doing is he's trying to come between God and his creation. He's trying to cause each one to doubt 
the good intentions and the goodwill of the other. This is the devil's MO. He'll do it in your marriage. He'll do it in your family. He'll try to do it in this church. He'll try to do it in our nation. He'll try to do it in the body of Christ. Why do we keep falling for this? This is not the way of the Holy Spirit. This is the way of the enemy. And you have people that they think their whole entire ministry is just to bring accusation and condemnation and, and, to, and to call everything out as though they were the newly appointed pope. Sometimes you'll see these people online. Nowadays, everybody's got a platform because of social media. You'll see them posting stuff in comment sections. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's that people are getting nastier. That could be because the Bible does say that in the last days, the love of many will run cold. Or it's just the fact that when you're in a chat room or in a comment section, you can hide behind the anonymity of that platform. You would never talk to anybody like that in real life or accuse somebody of those things to their face. But because you're just this little keyboard warrior in the privacy of your own bedroom, you can just spout off with all kinds of nastiness and vitriol. And can I tell you something? Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor is just as true on social media as it is face to face. Gossip and slander and lying, just because you're online, it doesn't mean that, you're, that you don't have to obey the scriptures. Somehow all of our Christianity goes out the window when we're on YouTube. I don't know why I went off that rabbit trail. But I, here's what I do want to say. We have got to fight for the unity of our families. We've got to fight for the unity of our church, of our church families, of our relationships. This doesn't come for free. We get it because we fight for it, because we notice and we recognize the value of it. And this is what Paul was doing. He was fighting for these people that he loved so much, even with strong language. Verse 12, tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you even know what the law actually says? It's a little bit condescending, a little bit facetious, but his point is well taken. Because keep in mind, these Gentiles that he's speaking to, they did not grow up under the law of Moses. This is some new thing that they're trying to take on. Paul has literally been in this thing his whole life. A Pharisee of Pharisees, trained by Gamaliel. This is a guy who, in, in terms of the way that he kept the law, he said, I'm flawless. And yet he's looking at these Gentiles and saying, you talk about obeying the law, you don't know what you're talking about. You have not even begun to scratch the surface. I was talking to a guy a while back who is on this trip of Torahism. Remember we talked about that? The, this idea of trying to become righteous by obeying the law of Moses. This is a big trend going on in the church right now. Did you know that? A lot of people, they're teaching that for a Christian, you still have to keep the law. You still have to observe the feasts and the holidays and you have to do it the way that it's prescribed in the Torah if you want to truly be righteous before God. And my, my, my comment to this guy, this Gentile, is do you even know what the law says? Because you're talking about keeping the law because you are eating this certain kinds of meat and not eating other kinds of meat. You don't understand. If you want to keep the law, I need to see the tag on your shirt and make sure there's no cotton or polyester mixed. I need to make sure you're not, uh, you know, you're, not, you're tithing not just the money in your account, but you need to tithe the mint and the cumin in your spice cabinet. All of it's got to be tied. I mean, if you're going to obey the law, you got to do it the way the law says. You don't get to make up your own version of keeping the law or pick this part and leave that part. This is what Paul is saying. You guys don't even know what you're talking about. Verse 22, the scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from the slave wife and one from the freeborn wife. Now, notice that Paul jumps right into the story here, referring to it as though everybody knew what he was talking about. They obviously were already familiar with this story. And I think that's because of two things. Number one, he was preaching to a people that were obviously biblically literate. Can I just take a moment to say something about biblical literacy? One of the things that's very challenging about preaching nowadays in America, and it's getting harder. You know, it used to be like this in Europe. When I would go to Europe, when I would preach, especially out 
in a public place, in an evangelistic context, I would have to dumb everything down to the point where if you talked about Adam and Eve, you had to like tell people who Adam and Eve are. If we talk about Jesus, you gotta first like tell people who Jesus is, because they don't know anything. Can I tell you, it's, it's becoming like that here. It's not just becoming like that in this nation, it's becoming like that in the church. Where people who have sat in the pews have never cracked their Bible and looked at it for themselves. So you always have to go back and give a bunch of context. I just, I know I do this often and I'm gonna keep doing it. I wanna encourage us as a church family to be a people that are people of the word. That we read the word, that we love the word, that we study the word. It's one of the reasons that I'm preaching expositorily like this. I want us to be a people that the word of God isn't just something out on the side that we point to once in a while as like a benchmark. That it's right at the center of who we are as a worshiping community. We love this word. And we don't take the word and twist it to back up whatever we're trying to teach. No, we align our lives with it. It is the plumb line. And so that was one thing is that they were biblically literate. But the other thing was that many commentators believe that what Paul is about to do here as he launches into this argument about Sarah and Hagar and Abraham, which is scandalous, by the way. So those of you that are falling asleep, you're going to want to miss this. It's like better than the days of our lives or whatever. So Bob are nowadays. But this was an argument that was being used by Paul's enemies. So what he's about to do, he's about to take that same argument, flip it around and go uno reverse. Uno reverse. Where are my Gen Zers at? Okay, so first of all, he's talking here about Abraham, Abraham's two sons, one from the slave woman, one from the free. What is that talking about? Well, again, 30,000 foot recap, okay? Abraham, God finds him in Ur of the Chaldees, makes a covenant with him, says, Abraham, I'm gonna make your descendants as numerous as the sand and the stars. An incredible promise. And then he, God actually changes his name to Abraham, which means father of multitudes. Now, I want you to imagine this. You got this guy, every time he introduces himself, he says, hi, my name is father of multitudes. Oh, wow. How many children do you actually have? Uh, none. Now that might not have been so embarrassing when he's 30, there's still time, 35, 40, eh, getting a little old. But Abraham is now like 80 years old and he still has no children. So he and his wife, Sarah, they start talking and Sarah comes up with this great plan. This is the soap opera part, are you listening? He says, you know, Abraham, uh, Hagar, she's my servant girl. She's pretty cute, she's young. Why don't you take her, have children through her, and then I'll just kinda, we'll just kinda count that as God fulfilling his promise. Isn't it funny how we think that we need to like help God along the way to, to fulfill his promises? It's like, God, you know, we, we know you're trying here, but we're gonna do our part, we're gonna help out. And so Abraham definitely does his part. Hagar gets pregnant, she gives birth to a son, and the son's name is? Ishmael. See, you guys are biblically literate. Good job. And so for a while, Abraham and Sarah are like, okay, that's it. Ishmael is, is the fulfillment of the promise. But about 14 years later, bada bing, bada boom, suddenly Sarah is pregnant and she gives birth to a son by the name of Isaac. So now you have two children. See, this is the problem whenever you try to help God out. God will let you do your thing, but then what happens when God actually does the thing that he wanted to do? Now your thing becomes the enemy of his thing. <laughs> this is the great quandary. See, we make our own messes. We make our own problems by trying to help God do what God said he was gonna do a different way. And so here you got Ishmael who's the older and Isaac who's the younger and Sarah begins to notice that Ishmael, this older, who's like a teenager by the time Isaac is born, 
Ishmael is mocking him and tormenting him and persecuting him. It's obvious this is never going to work. And so they send Ishmael and Hagar away. Now here is probably how Paul's opponents were using this story. They were saying something like this. Even though Ishmael was not the child of promise, he was still considered a child of Abraham as long as he obeyed the law of Moses. He had to be circumcised. He had to obey the law. So what these Judaizers were telling these Gentiles is, you are not the children of promise. We are the children of promise. We are like Isaac. You are like Ishmael. But because you are still children of Abraham, you must continue to obey the law of Moses if you want to stay like our stepbrother, our second-rate half-brother. Obey the law of Moses, and we'll give you a seat at the table. So Paul comes along, and he takes that same metaphor, and he completely flips the script. Paul had two sons, he said, one from the slave and one from the free wife, 23. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. Are you listening? You gotta listen to this argument. It's, it's powerful, it's profound, and it's revolutionary in Christian thought. The son of the slave woman was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of the promise of God. In other words, Ishmael is a symbol of what it looks like when man tries to fulfill God's promise with his own efforts. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. Can I tell you something? Isaac, it was not unlikely that Isaac would be born. It was literally, physically, humanly impossible. The only way that Isaac could have ever come about was through a miracle. These two women, verse 24, serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai, where people received the law that enslaved them. And now Jerusalem is like Mount Sinai in Arabia because she and her children live in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman, and she is our mother. This is where Paul completely twists the plot by saying to the Judaizers, all along you thought that you were Isaac, and you thought that your mother was Sarah. But I'm here to tell you that it's not the ones who earn salvation and earn their place by the work of their hands that are the children of the free woman. It is the ones who have been born by the Spirit. It is the ones who have come through simple faith. He's saying, you aren't Isaac at all. You're Ishmael, and your mother is Hagar. It's like the first yo mama joke. Yo mama is Hagar. Our mama is Sarah. And here's the question, who is your mama? This is the question. People say, oh, God is my father. Yeah, 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 but who's your mama? Abraham is my father. Yeah, fine, but what makes the difference, what decides whether you're the child of promise or the child of slavery is who is your mama? Is your mama works or is your mama faith? Hallelujah! Because whatever is not of faith is sin. Uh, go ahead, Jackie, give me some music. A little bit of sugar helps the medicine go down. I really want to get through this chapter. Can you give me just a couple more minutes? Verse 27, I, as Isaiah said, rejoice, O childless woman, you who have never given birth. Break into a joyful shout, you who have been, never been in labor. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaac. Can I tell you something? If you're in this room and you have surrendered your life to Jesus, you put your faith in Christ, you are a child of promise. This is why I get so nettled sometimes. I know it's an old-fashioned word, but it's a good one. When I see believers arguing, you, you, have you ever seen these Christians that they go and they, they get the DNA test to see like how much Jewish they've got? 
And if they've got like 0.001% Jewish, then they're all wearing the yarmulke and the prayer shawl or something. Or there's all these different theological fads going around. There's, you know, British Israelism and there's black Hebrew Israelism. And there's people that say, well, no, these Europeans are the Israelites. So those are the, this is the lost tribes and stop it. If, if you are looking at your DNA to decide whether or not you're a child of Abraham, you got this whole thing wrong. This is not about what's in your physical blood. Those who trust in Christ are the children of promise. I don't care what the DNA test says. The cross says I'm a child of God. And that's where I put my faith. That's where I put my confidence. That's what I rejoice in. Can you say amen? I know I'm offending people, but do you hate me because I tell you the truth? And you, brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaac. Verse 29, but, but now you are being persecuted by those that want to keep you under the law, just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. Can I just give you a little side note here? Whenever there's two sides and you want to know which one is of God and which one is not, which is the flesh, which is the spirit. Here's a little rule of thumb. Notice which side is doing the persecuting. Because the spirit of Christ is not a persecuting spirit. The spirit of Christ is not an accusing spirit. You know who the accuser of the brethren is? You can see right away Who's of the flesh and who the, who's of the spirit by who is persecuting who? And here you see that, that Ishmael thing, that religious thing, that performance thing, it's always jealous. It's always competitive. It's always persecuting the child of the spirit and the one born of faith. Verse 30, well, what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son. For the son of the slave woman will not share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. You can't mix these two things. You, you can't, you, you know, I, I was, well, I won't go there. If you have grace and a theology based on grace and a purity of the gospel, and then you say, well, I just want to make sure that people aren't, you know, living in license and sin. So I'm going to introduce a little bit of law. That little bit of leaven will leaven the whole lump. This is not, okay, Jesus died on the cross. He, he did this incredible work for us. So it's like 99% grace and 1% works. No, it's not 1% work. It's not 0.1% works. It's all grace. It's all him. Now, that doesn't mean we go live any way that we want to. It's the grace of God that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. But it's not because of our righteousness that God accepts us. He accepts us because of his grace, and because of our faith in him. So, verse 31, dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. And this is one of the most, you know, unfortunate divisions of chapters in the book of Galatians. I'm sure you guys know this, but the Bible is inspired, but the, where the verses are demarcated is not, right? You know that? That was somebody decided, we're going to go in there and split this all up. Sometimes they did a really good job. Sometimes they did a terrible job. In this case, Paul is making this incredible argument, building line upon line, and he builds up to this punchline. And just as he's about to give the punchline, they end the chapter. So you got to read the last verse of chapter 4 and the first verse of chapter 5 together. So dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, we are children of the free woman. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Hallelujah. And you'll, you'll recognize it. You'll recognize it in the ESV. It reads like this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Hallelujah. Can we stand together?
You know, it's interesting that Paul says that first verse of chapter five that way. He says, don't submit yourself to the yoke of slavery. And that's interesting to me because nobody becomes a slave on purpose, right? I mean, slavery is something that is inflicted upon a person against their will. And they struggle to get out from underneath it. But what's happening here is that Paul is talking to people who were already free. But now because of the way that the, that the word of God is being twisted and contorted, they're being attracted to voluntarily walk into a life of slavery and servitude. And Paul is saying, don't do it. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that you could become a slave of a system. Jesus died on the cross so you could be free and not just free on paper, but free indeed. Walk in that freedom, live in that freedom, work in that freedom. That's why Jesus died. And you know, that's obviously the context here is the law and the religious system. But I, I think it applies to so many things because Jesus died not just for freedom from religion. He died so you could have freedom from compulsions, from addictions. You don't have to be addicted to alcohol. You don't have to be addicted to drugs. You don't have to be addicted to pornography. You don't have to be addicted to cutting. You don't have to be addicted to bulimia. You don't have to be addicted to other people's opinions of you. You don't have to live by the fear of man. You can be truly, truly, truly free this morning. That's what Jesus died to give you. And so these Galatians, their problem was religious bondage. But what's your pro problem? What's your bondage? Can I tell you, whatever it is, Jesus died to break it off of you. And so would you just lift your hands with me? Lord, I just pray for this amazing congregation, this family. Lord, first of all, thank you for knitting our hearts together in love for the sake of your kingdom. And Lord, for those upon whom the enemy has tried to place a yoke of bondage. I declare freedom right now in the name of Jesus. I declare freedom over your mind in Jesus' name. I declare freedom over your body in the name of Jesus. I declare freedom over your family in the name of Jesus. I declare freedom over your church, over your ministry. In the name of Jesus, freedom. Freedom from you. Lord, set us free from ourselves. Set us free from our past. And release us into a glorious future, I pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Hallelujah.